Good morning, YouTube. All right. Here is the latest project, not the wagon. You've seen that already. Let's go over and there she is. It's a 1963, 63, 62. I'll confirm that. It's one of those, same thing, almost. Uh, Lincoln Continental. Uh, customer brought it to us for air ride and I don't normally do installs but this thing was just too cool to pass up so so yeah bring it on down we'll uh we'll get it dialed in for you so oh we're catching a mean glare um so yeah it's a, a lincoln continental it's got a an ls engine under the hood i think it's an ls3 um and it was already on air ride the uh the problems he was having is it was just sort of rudimentary uh uh, air suspension, so like a, a trailing arm two-link setup in the rear, uh, stock front suspension just with bags in place of the coils, so no shocks, and with the, the power he was making, uh, you know, just it didn't feel solid going down the road. So we're basically going to go through it and update all of that to chopping blocks, uh, front and rear suspension kits. Let me come over here where there's a little less glare. And uh, yeah, just freshen everything up. But quick rundown, you can see he's already got some big bare brakes in there, uh, 22 inch wheels, things all blacked out, all the trim and all the chrome and everything's been blacked out. Let's see in here. Very, very nice car. A lot of fun to drive. He drove it here from Mississippi to Oklahoma, 800 miles, and uh, and brought it to us. So we're excited to get started on it, and uh, yeah, we'll just get things moved around in the shop, get this thing on the rack, and uh, we'll show you what we're working with. So with the brake out of the way, you can get a little better look at how this was originally bagged. Let me see if I can get some light in there. So the original control arm on the lower was just plated over and the bag bolts right to that plate. There's a cup going up into the spring pocket. Pretty standard stuff. But the big issue with this, aside from worn out ball joints and yeah, those bushings are trash too, is there's no provision for a shock, so that leads to a really bouncy ride on the front. And with the LS3 under the hood on this thing, it just, you need a shock. Um, additionally, with the, the chopping block setup, the original radius arm that goes up to the mount right there, we've actually got it pulled off here. Um, so that bolts to the lower control arm on that end. And then over here, we've got a bushing with this bracket that mounts up to the uh, to the frame. And it triangulates the lower arm, keeps it from uh, shifting forward and backwards when you hit the brakes and all that. Um, so the downside to this one, these work fine for you know static suspensions, but this bushing, this pair of bushings right here, as the suspension cycles up and down, that has to be loose enough to pivot. Um, and what happens is when you go super low, like with a bagged vehicle, um, that basically gets into a bind, uh, or you have to loosen it enough to not bind, and then you've got sloppy handling. So, couple issues that we're gonna be addressing with the, uh, the new suspension. So, we'll get the rest of this off in just a bit here. Um, we've got new tubular upper and lower arms. I'll do, uh, I'll take some video of those before they go in and point out a few things. Looks like steering components have been replaced more recently, so that's good. They're all in good shape. Nothing really, nothing else under here to be worried about. No big rust issues or any of that. So yeah, stay tuned. We'll uh, get it to the next step.
All right, with all the stock suspension removed, we're ready to start putting the new parts in. There's a few things that have to be prepped before you just start bolting the control arms and bag and everything back in. So the first is we've got the new shock mount. And you can see that it picks up these two bolt holes that are already there. We're gonna have to drill those out a little bit and then add uh, nut certs, which are included with the kit. And once those are positioned, we'll mark and drill this hole down here. And then there's two more up there that we'll have to drill and, uh, and put nut certs in. And that'll secure the shock mount. on the upper part of the spring pocket, the original shock mount. We're gonna be unbolting the side that unbolts, which is this guy, uh, and we'll leave this one. There's a, a plate that goes across the top and, and spans that hole so that we can mount the upper cup through it that holds it in place. And then one other modification we're going to do on this one is the, upper, uh, the lower control arm, as it swings up, will contact right about here. So we're gonna loosely bolt the lower arm in, mark that area, and we'll be trimming that off. And then this guy right here is all gonna come off. So it extends into the spring pocket. So we just have to trim inside there along the weld. And then right up here, oh, try and focus it, along that weld. And then there's a couple spots right here where it wraps around. So we'll clearance that stuff, get that bracket out of the way, and then just touch those areas up with some paint, and we'll be good to go. Too shabby. Front ends apart. We're not doing any of the steering parts. All those.
tie rod ends and everything are in decent shape. So we're just letting that dangle for now. And then we've got uh, the original lower cross shaft bolts or lower control arm bolts, whatever you want to call them. Those have to get reused. So I'll hit those with a wire wheel, just clean them up a little bit, but they came out without too much trouble, which is great. Sometimes those things are rusted in place and it can be a real bitch. Um, here's some remnants of the, uh, the original lower control arm bushings. These things were just toast. Um, and then we do retain the upper control arm bolts on both sides. So I'll show you the, the new kit comes with new cross shafts, but uh, we do retain the, the original bolts. So come over here. We'll get to the rear soon. All right. So here is the complete chop and block front end kit for a 61 through 69 Lincoln Continental. So lower control arms come with new bushings, uh, Moog ball joints, and they're set up already for a uh, you know for the lower bag mount and a shock mount. The tension rod, which is bolted on on the original control arm is now part of the, the new aftermarket arm. And it comes out to this adjustable threaded end and you get a new bracket for the frame and they do a heim join up there. So I was mentioning the, the stock stuff binds up real bad. This gives you a lot more articulation um, and you can set your caster properly um, at your lowered ride height. Other than that, we've got new upper control arms. Like I said, they've come with new cross shafts, uh, new bushings, Moog ball joints. Um, and these Moog part numbers, I can get them for you. I'll put them down in the, the comments. They are uh, um, not for a Continental. So they're, they're totally available. They're a lot cheaper. And actually Moog has a lifetime warranty on their ball joints. So uh, if you do wear them out, you just go in and trade them out. Um, Chop and block kit also comes with new uh, upper bag cups and these bolt-on upper shock brackets, which I'll show you how those go in, and a new pair of KYB shocks, and then they include all the, the hardware and everything. So lower shock studs, and then uh, nut certs and hardware to mount the upper shock mounts. So as far as hardware you're gonna be reusing, you've got the upper control arm bolts where they go through the cross shaft, um, the lower control arm bolts, you'll be reusing those where they go through the cross member. And then on the, uh, the tension rod bracket or whatever you want to call it at the front under the radiator support, you'll be reusing those bolts that go through there and hold those brackets on. Aside from that, it's all new. So let's set up the tripod and we'll get started on putting this thing together. And I'm going to turn the heater back on. got these original bolts get reused holding the new bracket the tension rod bracket on and then the heim joint is adjusted just right to where everything lines up when the, the control arm's sitting basically at ride height so mm -hmm. as it cycles there's a little bit of movement forward and backwards your caster changes but that's that's how it was factory too so this gives you some adjustment to dial that in exactly but we basically put it to where at ride height, there's no bind in the bushing or anything. So it has travel in both directions.
what you just saw struggling with is getting that upper cup in position. There are little fingers on the inside of the pocket that held the coil centered in the pocket and the new cup actually engages those as well. So getting it properly centered in there, getting the stud up through here and getting this washer on and also not kinking the airline is uh, it's a balancing act. So we ended up just using one of the pull jacks and uh, once we got the bag basically in position, just jacked up the lower arm until it uh, popped into place and tightened it down. So we've ground off the excess metal here and here. So the arm has clearance. I'm gonna hit those with a little bit of spray paint. This isn't a show car or anything, at least not underneath. So we'll just touch up those areas so nothing rusts. And then it's ready to finish putting back together. All right, with the front end basically done, we are moving to the rear. And again, this was bagged already at some point by somebody who pretty much knew what they were doing. This isn't a real elegant solution, but it's solid. It doesn't have any major issues. The big deal is that it's a two link. Um, so it has no articulation. It puts everything in kind of a bind anytime you go up a driveway at an angle or anything like that. Just, you know, the pinion angle doesn't, uh, it changes dynamically as, as the suspension cycles. It's just not ideal. Uh, so we're hoping to replace that with the chopping block, uh, triangulated four link setup, uh, which will hopefully improve the ride quality, make it handle better. And if we're really lucky, it'll get lower too. So. You can see this thing has a devious fuel cell in it. Hopefully we're not going to have to mess with any of that. And I've already started cutting some of the exhaust away. The exhaust is going to have to get rerouted. The cross member for the chopping block system goes right in the way of where that's routed. So first step, we'll get everything disassembled and assess what we've got from there. And then I'll get some video of us putting it back together. All right, stay tuned. All right, I'm doing this a little bit out of order since I've already test fit a few of these pieces, but I wanted to show you the complete rear kit on the table so we can go over some of the details and get you familiar with it before it's all just bolted on there. Uh, so obviously these are the frame notches. This makes it a stage two, um, get you an extra about three inches of drop if you have the wheel clearance for it up in the wheel wells. So if you're running a big 22 inch wheel and you want to lay it out, you might be doing some mini tubs as well, but this will get you down if, if you've got the clearance. 
Um, moving over here, these are the axle brackets. So they're gonna go right onto uh, the leaf spring perch. They actually have the little notch piece that, uh, that engages the perch on the stock axle. Comes with new U-bolts. So once you get this on, I've got it upside down. Once you get this on, there we go. That's got the, the upper mounts for your triangulated uh, upper links and then the lower mounts for the lower bars. Um, so left and right of those, obviously. New shocks with studs and hardware. Lower bars, so they've got bushings, grease zerks. The bag brackets and shock mounts are built onto them. So this all just bolts together. And then these are the upper bars. They use heim joints on there, so you've got a little better articulation, no bind. Um, and the, uh, the adjustability you need. So they're left and right hand threaded, so you can actually adjust these without having to take them off the vehicle. And then finally, you've got the, the upper bridge. So these upper brackets uh, go on the sides of the frame. They engage the factory holes uh, that held the leaf spring hanger. You see there's different hole patterns. 61 through 63 have this longer uh, bolt configuration and then 64 through 69 engage these holes and then these are slotted to catch them as well. This reuses the stock hardware, which is why these have some, uh, some rusty uh, debris on them because I test fitted them already. Those go up the side of the frame and then they include a little uh, uh, 3 8 self-tapping bolt and that's gonna go into the side of the frame just to hold that in position and keep it from moving around. And then this is the upper bag bracket for each side. And then this bridge piece bolts right onto these, right through these holes, it sits on top. Basically this is upside down. And this has your upper shock mounts and the upper link mounts and then ties across the, the bottom of the floor behind the seat area um, with some nut certs to secure everything. So once you bolt it together, it's super solid, helps keep the stress points in the factory locations, you know, ties into that. Um, and uh, it just gives you a nice solid ride. So they include all the hardware you'll need. So those are the link bolts, those are the shock bolts and studs, and then these are the nut certs and all of the, uh, the half inch hardware you're gonna need and actually some, some larger stuff too. So I'm gonna figure out where everything goes. Um, one thing I will recommend, they include a half inch bolt and nut and some washers to do these uh, nut certs. So if you've never seen a nut cert before, basically you drill your hole, uh, like for a half inch, you're gonna be drilling it larger, probably closer to a five eighths, um, until this whole unit fits through the sheet metal. And then you'll grab the nut with uh, a wrench and then tighten the bolt down. And what that's gonna do is deform this thing and actually pinch it into the hole from the backside. So you don't have to have access to the backside to get a nut on it. Um, this will work, but especially with a half inch, even greasing this, it's gonna be a big pain in the butt. So if you have the funds in your budget, I highly, highly, highly recommend picking up this guy for Mastro Pneumatic. I got this one off of Amazon. I wanna say it was a couple hundred bucks. It's not cheap. Uh, nothing on these Continentals is, as you're probably discovering if you're working on one, but this saves so much time. This guy came with a 3 8 16 and a half 13 collet, and I've got the 3 8 on there right now. We use these for the front shock mounts, and it makes life so easy. Um, let, me, let me set the camera down to see if I can get it on the, uh, support it on the tripod here. Oh boy. See if I can really make a mess of this. Stay where you're at. All right. Let's see if I can stay in the frame here. Actually, I've got this piece of metal. Let's see. Am I in? All right. So basically, you have a thread in and a thread out button. Um, all you do is stick this through the hole. Normally, you wouldn't have access to the backside, obviously, but hold it firm against there and then just. Uh, <laughs> Once it stops, it's tight and, and in, and then back it back off. You can see that thing's just locked in. So it's, it, man, it just saves so much time versus doing them by hand. It's crazy. 
So that would be one of my big tool recommendations. Most of the rest of this kit can be installed with just basic hand tools, but that is one thing that, man, if you can, if you can swing it, tell your buddies to go in on, on it with you or whatever, um, that thing will come in handy. It'll, it'll change your life. Um, but yeah, that's basically the kit right there. So what we've done here is we took the, the notch that actually goes on the other side of the car and bolted it to the outside of the, the frame rails. And then the, the one that'll actually go on here is on the inside. So this will actually bolt to the outside uh, when everything's done. But this lets us basically bolt it in place with the two existing holes that are already in the frame uh, that were for the, the cross member that goes across. Basically we bolt that in snug, get it in position, and then we can mark. You can see we've already got our marks for where we're gonna cut. Um, and we're actually gonna cut a quarter inch above these lines to account for the thickness of the material because this, this plate is gonna go on the bottom of the, uh, you know, cap off the, uh, the frame rail that we're cutting out. So once that's cut and we can bolt this in tight, then we can mark these two holes um, and it'll actually bolt in completely to finish it off. We already did that side over there but I figured I'd show you before we cut kind of the process on laying this out and getting it in position. So here we go. All right, so notches are bolted in and we have bolted in temporarily, bolted in the side plates and the bridge plate. So what we're gonna do, we've got them secure and in position. We're gonna mark all of the holes in this plate that need to be drilled into the sheet metal of the, uh, the underfloor structure for those nut certs. So we've got, what is it? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine nut certs that are gonna go in here. So we're gonna mark all those, get the nut certs in, um, and then we can uh, uh, bolt all this up for the last time. All right, a little more progress. We've got everything cinched down, got the bags mounted, got the upper and lower bars in position. So really it's down to the axle. And in a normal installation, we would just be keeping the stock axle in the stock location as we worked. But uh, this customer ended up buying a whole new axle from Quick Performance. So we've got sitting down here on the ground, uh, whole center section. He went with a limited slip and I can't remember the ratio. I want to say it was a 360, 370 something. Anyway, it'll be a better match with his LS and his, uh, I think he's got a 4L80 uh, transmission in this thing. So. That'll be a big improvement. Really the only trick is the axle housing comes bare. It's upside down right now, but he's doing a Ford nine inch, obviously. Um, what we did was we designed some new axle perches um, that match the diameter of this new axle, which is a little larger than the, uh, the original stuff. And then this big old hole actually engages uh, the factory leaf springs and also the the brackets on the uh, the chop and block kit. So if you look in here, there it is. So that'll rest right in there. Leaf, uh, the U-bolts on either side will cinch everything down and then we'll be dialed. So all we had to do on the original axle, we, uh, we measured the pinion angle uh, off of the, the brackets, you know, compared to the brackets. It looks like it's about five degrees up 
Uh, so we're gonna weld these new perches at five degrees and, uh, and at the same spacing on the axle as, uh, as the original ones and everything should line up from there. We've got plenty of adjustment in the forelink itself. So even if the, the five degrees isn't completely dialed, we're gonna be messing with that anyway to get it, you know, pointing the way it needs to point and all that good stuff. So um, yeah, that's the next step. We gotta weld those perches on and then we'll put all the studs in for the third member. And then before we load this thing with axles and a third member and make it weigh 200 pounds, we'll just put this bare axle housing up in there bolt it in, get everything dialed, and then we can heft the uh, the third member up in there and then stab the axles in and put the, all the brakes and everything back on at that point. So yeah, it, uh, it'll actually make things a little easier for us uh, as far as managing the weight as we go. But yeah, that's the next step. We're on it. Fresh new day. Before the end of the day yesterday, we pulled out the new axle housing and welded the new perches on. And then before I shut the shop down for the night, I threw a couple coats of just satin paint on this thing. So that's all dried up and we're ready to get that up on the car. These are the brackets for the upper and lower links that attach to the axle. So to prep those, Chop and Block makes them with two different size, um, basically they can accommodate the two different size axle uh, tubes that Lincolns come with. Some of them have three inch, some of them have three and a half or three, three and a quarter, I believe. Um, so the original one was a three inch and these fit fine like this but the new axle housing has a little bit thicker uh, axle tubes. So all we have to do is just grind down these little perches right here, make them flush with the, the rest of the, the half circle, and then this will drop right on. So I'm gonna knock that out real quick and then we'll get these bolted on, get this up in the car. All right, guys, it has been a couple of days. We, uh, we worked through most of last week, but we ended up with a big winter storm that rolled through, went from 70 degrees and sunny on Monday to uh, snowing and like in the teens on Wednesday. So Wednesday through Friday, we weren't really out here in the shop doing a whole lot. I got a few things done, but it was just too damn cold, uh, even with my fire going. So. The good news is that we are basically done with this thing and we are ready for the transporter to come pick it up. So I just wanted to run through it real quick and kind of give you a rundown on what we did to finish it up, some of the snags we ran into, and uh, yeah, just kind of give you the final overview of the installation because we have uh, taken it for a drive and it is, uh, it's pretty, pretty friggin' rad. So, all right. Um, Working from the back forward, we got the exhaust reinstalled. Um, with the chop and block kit, having those upper link bars, uh, which you can see up in there, the old exhaust routing that went up and over the axle just wasn't gonna work. Um, so we had the muffler shop. Here, let me back up. 
back up a little bit, uh, pick up from the X-pipe and then work back under the axle and back to the, the mufflers that were on this thing when, uh, when he dropped it off. So no, uh, no harm done. It's still higher than the rest of the car, higher than the fuel cell at the back. Um, so there's nothing, you know, no worry about it contacting anything. And you can see, you know, with it being on the rack right now, it's at full droop and there's still a little bit of clearance between the, uh, the axle housing and the, the exhaust tubing. So overall it should, I mean, there's less bend, so I guess it probably makes a little more power too, but that wasn't really the main reason for, for going under the axle. Obviously, if you ever needs to drop the axle completely for whatever reason, I mean, it's brand new, so hopefully that won't be the case. Um, but if he did, that uh, that would require uh, you know cutting and flanging the exhaust at some point. But for our uh, for our purposes, that wasn't necessary um, to add those flanges. So uh, rear end, we got all the the bare brakes reinstalled on the the new rear end. No drama there. Everything went smoothly. We got them bled out, um, and that that all went fine. The only snags we ran into were, um, I don't know if I covered this already, the drive shaft had to be lengthened. Um, so that was an un unwelcome surprise, but thankfully we've got a, a pretty kick-ass drive shaft shop not too far from here. So we're able to get a new drive shaft made with the correct uh, rear U-joint. And then uh, it ended up needing to be, you know, two and five eighths inch longer to, uh, to account for the shorter nose on this axle housing um, on the nine inch. Um, additionally, the, the pinion on a nine inch, um, basically the way this axle was made, the pinion ended up being about two inches uh, left of the stock one or what was in here originally. So whoever did the original tub work in the drive shaft tunnel, um, we weren't able, it basically the drive shaft hit the side of it before it hit the top of it. So we weren't able to get the, the car all the way low without contacting it. So we just basically cut a small section out, uh, for a temporary solution and just patched it up. It's not the prettiest thing in the world, but it is sealed up. We did seam sealer and it's, it's basically just screwed in place. I didn't want to have to pull all this carpet out cause it's all glued down and I couldn't weld with, uh, you know, with all the carpet and, and under, uh, you know, insulation and everything in its way. So when he addresses the other issue with the rear end, uh, they may have to go back and, and do some more tub work. So I didn't want to put too much effort and cost into, into, you know, tubbing the rear end. The other big issue with this new axle is, and I haven't measured uh, with the wheels off, but basically it sits wider than the stock one. Um, so I don't know if, if someone made an error on the, the spec or, or what, but uh, basically before this thing gets all the way up into those frame notches, it contacts, the tire contacts inside the wheel well. And I don't know with this light, you might be able to see where it's been rubbing. Um, so we've talked with the owner. He may end up just cutting and tubbing inside the wheel well to get better clearance or if uh, if US Mag makes this wheel with maybe like a one inch narrower offset, um, you know, sucked in, you'd get that clearance you need. There's plenty of room to the inside, um, so that may be a, a better solution. But basically, once he gets that sucked in um, or clearanced, then the car will go another, you know, about two inches lower. Uh, but then the other the other problem will be he'll have to to redo the drive shaft tunnel. It'll have to go up higher, and it's already sitting at the base of the seat back frame. Um, so that won't be a super easy solution, unfortunately. But that's uh, that's kind of his call to make. I mean, I'll I'll show you some some video of this thing sitting down. It's already properly low, but you know it's it's like everything else. It's never low enough, fast enough, loud enough. Um, so that's, that's up to him if he wants to take it to that next level. Um, as far as plumbing and wiring, there's not a whole lot under here to, to speak of, but we, uh, we followed the original, uh, uh, fuel lines, air horn lines. Um, and then on this side, the brake line and old fuel line. Um, we basically ran along with, uh, with those all the way to the front for the height sensor wiring. 
and then it just follows up along the airlines uh, way up above all the suspension and everything, and it's just tucked up out of the way. So no big deal there. Um, the height sensors, I'll try and get up in there and show you what we did. Um, so we've got these uh, tube clamps from Chop and Block that, uh, that we affixed to the, the lower uh, link bars. And then the, the upper, the actual height sensor itself, here, I'll go to this side, is mounted uh, right to the, the side of the subframe rail or unibody rail or whatever you want to call it. Um, so real simple setup, little uh, standoffs for the, uh, the linkages just to get everything sort of in line, um, but it all measures out fine. We left a little bit of extra travel um, Basically, you know, jack the axle all the way up with the, the wheels off uh, and with the drive shaft off so we could get it up into the notch and, uh, and have enough travel in the height sensor for him to be able to make those, those changes to the rear suspension without uh, having to redo the height sensors, their positioning or anything. So you'll just have to recalibrate the system at that point and it'll be good to go. Um, aside from that, out back we did, you know, all the bolt check, Checked all the, the clearances and everything. Um, the drive shaft is, the pinion on the axle is pointing down a little bit further than we'd like. Um, I went and test drove it and got it up to about 70. If you're rolling super low, it starts getting a little vibration. Um, but again, it's to help with the clearance to the floor. So it's another one of those, if he wants to change that and give up some of the drop or do some more cutting, um, that's totally up to him, but at this point, I know he's eager to get the car back. It's totally drivable as it is. You just have to drive a little bit higher, um, if you're going to be, you know, accelerating hard or, or driving fast or whatever. Um, but it still rides great. So it's kind of like, you know, whatever, something you can address later. Um, but yeah, let's move to the front and I'll show you. Whoa. All right. So up front, same deal. Let me get up in there, Ooh, see if I can get the light on it with the camera and everything. Oh boy, all right. Let's see if I can do this a different way. Uh, there they are. So there's the height sensor tucked up into the wheel well, mounted to the, the upper control arm with, with a short linkage. Um, again, you know, from full droop to full compression, it, uh, it all clears just fine and uh, ran the wiring for that and the airline up into the factory wheel well, which we've got a little corrosion happening there, but let's not worry about that. But there's already a bunch of brake lines, fuel lines and all that. So we just basically followed along that stuff and, and brought it out along the, uh, the pinch weld. And you can see it's all tucked up enough that even when it's on the rack or whatever, it's not gonna be an issue. Uh, there's all kinds of stuff that sits lower than that. So no big deal there. Um, did our final bolt check and everything. Everything stayed torqued just fine. Bags aren't rubbing on anything. Um, we took it over right across the street from Mustang Muffler was Mustang Alignment. And uh, so we went ahead and just did a quick toe angle uh, alignment on the, the car just to make sure it was safe to run down the road, you know, and not wear the tires out immediately. Once he figures out his comfortable ride heights, and gets those presets dialed, um, then he'll have to go in and actually have a, a full alignment done. But with him not being a local customer, we don't really have the ability to have him, you know, dial in that, that comfortable ride height and then go get the full alignment done. It just wouldn't make sense for us to, to charge him to do that and then say he ends up wanting to ride around, you know, an inch lower or an inch higher than we had pre you know, preset it for he'd be paying twice. So we just do the, the quick toe alignment. This does camber a bit when it's fully dropped and that's that's by nature. The upper arms are shorter than the lowers. Um, but, uh, but, you know, aside from the camber change, the toe change isn't real significant on these cars. So he'll basically, you know, get his right height dialed, take it to his local alignment shop and they can adjust the caster, uh, get the camber at ride height dialed in and then uh, and set the toe from there. So. That's basically it underneath. Let me get it dropped down and then I'll show you the, uh, the trunk and, uh, and then I'll, I'll show you the inside as well. And then we'll, uh, we'll wrap things up. Being that he already had air suspension in here, we didn't wanna go drilling a whole bunch of extra holes in, uh, in the trunk floor. 
Um, and he was already used to using the main you know, cargo area of the trunk. So we wanted to kind of stick with where he had the original stuff. Um, so the main changes we made, obviously, he went from one steel tank, which I think was a, it's either a five or a six gallon um, that was mounted back here. And then his 3P manifold was mounted there. And then you can still see the bolt holes from the two Vire 444s that were mounted straight to the floor. So what we did instead is I had this laser cut panel made uh, with these gussets. Basically, it got formed right along this seam uh, at a 90 degree. And the tank, the first tank mounts right to the original footprint of the steel tank he had in there. So we, we picked up those same exact bolt holes, uh, although I threw some, uh, some nut certs into the trunk floor. Um, so it's a little easier to install. Um, and then the compressors are actually hanging sideways above on the top of the bracket. Um, so you can kind of see how they're mounted up in there. And we went to, uh, we went with two Vire 485 C compressors, uh, with two five gallon tanks. So it's a pretty good match. You know, this, this car is heavy. It uses a lot of air. Um, so he's got a lot on, on reserve. And then the 485s are totally up to the task of filling the, the two tanks back up. Um, the manifold, we just remounted in the same, uh, location that it was. It's out of the way. It's fine. Um, but basically we gained a little bit more trunk space and ended up with, with more equipment, um, without, uh, without taking up more trunk. So it's tight. Some of the, the bolts were, uh, were a bit challenging to, uh, to get fastened, but it all, uh, it all turned out pretty good. I think it's, uh, it's ready for him to, you know, build some panels and, and flesh out the rest of the trunk when, uh, when it comes time. Um, there was a inline fuse right here. Originally we changed that to a, uh, a hundred amp breaker. Um, so if he ever needs to cut power to the, the air ride system, basically you can just hit the, the breaker right there. And then there's another one under the hood, obviously, you know, right by the battery in case anything shorts, you want to, uh, address that. So other than that, we left most of the wiring intact. There's, you know, the addition of the height sensor wiring, and then we redid the, uh, the second compressor harness. Um, what was in there was, um, you know, not dangerous or anything, but it was, you know, kind of handmade. So... We went ahead and addressed that. Other than that, left it alone. And uh, that's basically the whole system in a nutshell. All right, I went ahead and started the car so we can have uh, everything working while we're uh, messing with the, the air ride. So basically we've got the same controller as you're used to seeing. It's a, a 3P, 3H system. So we've got our, our low, regular, and then high ride settings, individual controls for all four corners, and then an all up and an all down uh, control. So to get it off the rack here, I'm just gonna go ahead and put it on the, the highest setting. And with the height sensors, it's going to read and adjust. Once it stops blinking, we know we're, we're dialed in. So there you go. And that should allow me to move the rack arms. There we go. Let's get all those moved out of the way. life right should be able to drop this thing let me set the the camera down at a good height here Let's see. how's that look all right let's walk over there and hit that down So you can see the front. I was talking about that camber. It does get some camber change, but the front is as low as those wheels will allow. And we are uh, 
basically resting on the exhaust is resting on that uh, that cross member of my lift, and then out back. Take you around, and it's uh, it's pretty dang low. Let me pull it out of the shop real quick here and uh, we'll walk around it outside with some sunlight hitting it. I don't remember if we showed you under the hood of this thing, but that is a, a lovely LS engine swap. Optima battery, nice clean intake. That's the bare uh, master cylinder. Just a really well sorted turnkey, start it up, go anywhere kind of thing. You drove this thing 800 miles from Mississippi out here to have us do the air ride setup. And aside from one broken wheel on a, uh, a nasty pothole, it did uh, did the trip with no issues whatsoever. So, about it. I'm going to put the back seat bottom back in and load this thing up with all of his old air ride parts. And the transporter should be coming to pick it up here uh, tonight or tomorrow. So I get to go through all this footage and try and turn it into a video that isn't two hours long and boring as hell. that's about a wrap for this guy thank you again for watching through this whole video if you did if you wanted to skip around and just catch some of the highlights on the suspension I totally understand no hard feelings whatsoever we will be addressing the wagon soon in another video we've got some updates on it and getting it ready for uh, LST here in a few weeks someday I'll do a video about uh, the old daily driver G8 the Shelby and then I'll mention it again well at least we have a deadline for it now it's got to be ready by summer so yeah stay tuned on that one too all right guys as always thanks for watching like comment subscribe you know the whole YouTube rigmarole uh, thanks so much